Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining VHA Home Healthcare's Client and Family Town Hall. My name is Tracy Turriff, and I am VHA's Senior Communications and PR Manager. This morning, we will be answering pre-submitted questions and providing updates on our COVID response and on vaccination at VHA. If you have any technical difficulties during the call, please email communications at vha.ca or you can call 416-280-8426 and we will get right back to you to help you out. We're recording this town hall and we'll make the recording available afterwards. To begin, VHA Home Healthcare would like to acknowledge that we are living and working on Indigenous land. Toronto is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And I will now turn it over to Catherine Nichol to get us started. Thank you, Tracy, <clears throat> and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. <clears throat> We certainly appreciate this opportunity to uh, connect with you and share all that we are doing to provide safe care for clients and families and safe work for our staff and our service providers. So during the last 18 months, I've heard from many clients and their families, many wanting to express their thanks for the dedicated and compassionate care that they've received during the pandemic. And of course, some expressing valid concerns. And I just wanted to say that I appreciate your support and I welcome these calls and these emails. I know how important our care is to you and your families and it's a responsibility that we take very seriously. Your calls help me and all of us, um, especially those of us that are here this morning to understand and stay focused on what matters most to you. There's certainly a few key areas of concern going on right now in, uh, in the health system, but a key area of concern for the home care se uh, sector has really been a lack of health human resources. And while capacity in personal support services has been a longstanding concern for all home care providers in Ontario, the pandemic has really intensified the situation. And now, unfortunately, we're experiencing a shortage of nurses as well. And you would have heard and read about this in the media. We aren't alone in this as every corner of the health system is hiring nurses. And I wanted to reassure you that we are focusing intently on recruitment and retention and working closely with health system partners to align our efforts. One of the key learnings over the last year and a half has been that home care is a very, very safe way to receive care during a pandemic, possibly the safest way. Uh, VHA was able to provide training and personal protective equipment to our teams. And as an essential healthcare service, we were able to provide continuous care from March 2020, right at the beginning of the pan uh, pandemic through to today. And thankfully, there were very few cases of transmission of infection between workers and clients across the whole home care sector in Ontario. In recent months, we've been extensively involved in vaccination efforts, both supporting our team members to get vaccinated, uh, but also helping with vaccination clinics and outreach across our communities. And in early September, you, uh, you'll likely be aware that Ontario's Ministry of Health issued a directive, they call it uh, Directive Number 6, and it was a directive to home care organizations, including VHA, that requires mandatory reporting of vaccination status. So I'm pleased to share that in addition to complying with Directive Number 6, VHA is taking the further step of making vaccination mandatory for all of our staff, service providers, students, and volunteers. And to hear more about this um, and other uh, updates, I'm pleased to pass things over to members of my team. So Kathy Sidhu, VHA's Interim Vice President of Quality, Best Practice in Education. And Kathy's also the lead of our pandemic response team. David Fry, VHA's Vice President of Client Services, who just joined our organization this summer. And Kelly Myers, our Vice President of Human Resources and Organizational Development. So we'll have brief updates and then we'll answer um, a number of questions that were submitted ahead of the call. 
Uh, so we hope that you find this information helpful. Thank you again for joining us this morning. And Kathy, without further ado, I'll pass it over to you. Great, thank you, Catherine. And good morning to everyone who was able to join the call today. I'm really happy to be here, like Catherine said, to be able to share some more details about VHA's ongoing response efforts to COVID-19 on behalf of our pandemic response team. So this pandemic response team is really like um, a task force. And as Catherine mentioned, I've had the pleasure of leading that over the last short while. And, and the real focus of this task force is to monitor and respond to all the twists and turns that we've seen since wave one. And this group still remains very, very active um, 20 months later as we're in the thick of wave four. And the primary goal of this, this team or this task force that we have is to ensure that we're always staying ahead of and on top of Ministry of Health guidance and directives, public health orders and requirements with the ultimate goal of making sure that we're keeping all of our team members and all of our clients and families as safe as possible. So on to the next slide. Uh, oh, actually, no, same slide, sorry. Um, you're gonna see that I'm just gonna provide an update today on two critical areas where our team has been spending the majority of its time over the last short while. So we're gonna give some information related to infection prevention and control, or you're gonna hear me uh, refer to that as IPAC. Um, so that's sort of our infection prevention and control area. And the other um, big hot topic around vaccination and um, talk to you a little bit more about our vaccination plan. So on the next slide to start with infection prevention and control. So as expected, you know, in the face of an infectious disease related health crisis, IPAC practices have been front and center, you know, throughout the pandemic and they have been absolutely paramount. Now, what some of you may have seen in the news over this time with the pandemic is really infection prevention and control um, information specific to hospitals and long-term care. Um, but we obviously as a home healthcare organization have really been focused on guidance specific to our home care setting and our home care environments. And we um, have a specific guidance document that we follow and it's noted there on the bottom of the slide. It's the COVID-19 guidance home and uh, for home and community care providers um, that comes out from the Ministry of Health. And there have been six um, iterations of this and revisions over the course of the pandemic. Um, so that's where we've been focused and making sure that we're, we're up to date and responding to, to some of the changes within that document. So most of what I'm gonna share right now on this screen, I think Kathleen alluded to that, you know, we implemented these right away and we've just sort of been refining them or tweaking them over time, you know, when and where we need to based on the updates on the key documents. But in all instances, we've either met or surpassed IPAC requirements and all of our practices and processes are hardwired. They're part of our day-to-day, -day. they're our, part of our day-to-day -day regular routine. So as you can see on the slide, there are quite a number of IPAC measures that we have in place. And when layered all together, um, these have made our VHA home care services, and as Catherine mentioned, the home care setting, actually one of the safest sectors to receive health services. So to start, um, one of the IPAC measures we have in place, uh, a very important one is daily screening assessments um, for COVID-19. So many of you will be familiar with this. And many of us are now all very familiar with the screening questions that come in almost every place that we go, um, just checking for signs and symptoms in certain situations um, uh, that would predispose someone to COVID-19. So not only are our staff and service providers screening our clients and families, they're doing that screening prior to doing visits. Our staff and our service providers, care providers are screening themselves each and every day before they go to work. Um, and then we have strong protocols that, you know, if there are concerns or if they're flagged, they are not going to work that day. So that's sort of the very first um, important layer. And then the next uh, very important um, layer in IPAC is personal protective equipment. And we have um, really put a lot of time and energy to establishing ways of getting PPE out to our staff and service providers. So that they have a constant supply of this um, very important personal protective equipment with them. It includes things like, you know, their masks, their eye protection, gowns and gloves, 
um, and everybody is very well stocked uh, so that they're able to deliver care safely with all of the equipment that they need. Next, another big bucket that we had that Catherine mentioned is uh, we have done a lot of knowledge-based education and training with our team specific to COVID-19. Um, we have a specific uh, learning module that people must complete that tells them all about the infection uh, prevention and control information about COVID-19. And then we have a lot of additional supplemental information. So we have great video clips on specific um, infection uh, topics. We have posted open Q&A question and answer forums around infection prevention and control. We have a really great dedicated inbox where people can ask questions that they have about um, infection prevention and control and they get answers in real time. And then we have all of our uh, resources posted on our internet and they're available to our staff and service providers 24 seven. Um, additionally at BHA, we're extremely fortunate to have a dedicated um, infection prevention and control leader. Um, this individual is truly an IPAC expert and is dedicated to monitoring all of the IPAC requirements and identifying how, is an, how we're going to implement them as an organization and embed them into our practices. So he does a lot of that um, translation and, and helps the organization uh, put all of this in, into the front line and into our operations and processes. This individual is also connected with many IPAC leaders, not only within the home care sector, but other sectors. So always staying on top of and abreast of all of the IPAC activities. And this individual is also extremely busy and, and has a lot of time focused at the ground level, supporting our teams and our supervisors with IPAC questions that come in. So we really have a strong framework of support and resources to our staff around IPAC. Last layer, the last layer here is, is a big one as well, and it's vaccination. And we have spent a serious amount of time in this area, as you can imagine. So right when vaccinations were rolling out, as we recall, at the end of 2020, BHA was quick to develop a position statement that it really proclaimed our organizational stance right away that we were an organization that strongly encouraged vaccination. And that was a message that we circulated loud and clear, both internally in our organization, as well as externally. Um, with vaccination really being um, an additional measure to help reduce the spread of COVID-19, to reduce the risk of serious illness and hospitalizations, and really being an extra safety measure um, to help us move through the pandemic. So internally around vaccination, we've done, uh, have had focused efforts, I'd say in three main areas. So one is around promoting vaccination. So telling people, you know, where and how and when they can get vaccinated. Uh, you know, we found that we're constantly posting and circulating all of these opportunities and helping people navigate their being able to get out for first and second doses. The next bucket was really trying to help people understand um, any hesitancies that they had related to vaccination and um, do having strategies where we could do things to help increase their confidence to go and get vaccinated. So we did a survey to try to understand, you know, what was holding individuals back. And then we tried to address some of those hesitancies or those concerns, again, providing more information and hosting um, webinars and question and answer sessions. And then lastly, you know, we did what we could, um, everything we could to remove barriers for people to get out to get vaccinations. So we supported individuals with time off work so that they could go out and get those important doses um, that they needed, again, to try to strengthen our workforce in supporting um, increasing our vaccination rates. I do want to let you know as well, externally, uh, we were involved uh, quite a bit with the vaccination as well. Uh, we did release our position statement early on externally, uh, where we also encouraged our clients and families to get vaccinated for the same reasons. Um, but then we were also fortunate to be able to partner with many other health healthcare organizations to actually drive and administer vaccinations. So being on the end of actually supporting administration um, of vaccinations in Ontario, particularly in the GTA by supporting either on-site clinics or supporting mobile uh, vaccination clinics. So as you can see, you know, this slide here and what it contains has really been um, keeping our task force uh, Busy. This is a very important area, and um, we 
we continue uh, to work in this, in this realm. So that's a little overview there. And now I'm actually going to move on to vaccination itself in terms of our vaccination plan that Catherine alluded to. So all of the pre-vaccination work that we did um, really positioned us well to launch what we call, we have a two-phased vaccination plan, as, as Catherine mentioned. I'm going to provide an overview to tell you what that's about so that you can understand it a little bit and you can understand where we're at in our vaccination uh, progress. So the, I'm going to start first with phase one. And phase one was triggered by that directive number six that Catherine mentioned. Um, this, is a, this was a mandatory uh, directive that was announced on August 17th by Ontario's Chief Medical Officer of Health. And in that announcement, um, there, it was mandated that all home and community care organizations, including BHA, um, the requirement was to report. And we had to report on one of the three options below. Every um, staff, service provider, student and volunteer had to report at BHA if they were either fully vaccinated, if they had a medical exemption for not being vaccinated, or they had to provide proof that they complete, completed an education learning module about vaccination. In addition, um, in Directive 6, there's also a requirement that for anyone who is not fully vaccinated with two doses of vaccination, um, they need to participate in a rapid antigen testing uh, program and they're, they're required to do that. So this first phase um, and the Directive 6, um, they actually gave us a specific date to implement, and that was September 7th. So that really shaped the timing of phase one. So we had to have this in place by phase one, and, and we did that and, and met that requirement. So now moving on to phase two, um, this actually happened on September 3rd. So just after the announcement of Directive number six, VHA, along with 22 other home and community care service provider organizations, we announced our voluntary decision to move to mandatory vaccination. And this truly, phase one was all about reporting information, and phase two is truly about, about being vaccinated. Um, so you're going to see in this phase that all team members are required to have two full doses of vaccine, or um, have a medical or human rights exemption. And the option, Tracy, if we click um, just two more times, so it's not about reporting, and this option for individuals who have done the e-learning, those individuals um, would not meet the criteria uh, in mandatory, they would have to be vaccinated in, in this actual phase. So I'm pleased to be able to share some of the results with you about um, our vaccination rates. If we move on to the, on to the next, slide, you'll see here that we have had a 94 response um, rate or reporting rate, again, that reporting requirement. So 94% of our, our workforce um, has reported their vaccination results. And of that 94%, 92% currently have two full doses of vaccination. So they're fully vaccinated. But that number actually goes up to 97% when we include individuals who have just had their first dose or are planning on getting vaccinated. Um, so I do want to pause here and just say how, um, how impactful this is and how powerful this is to see that VHA as an organization will essentially have a 97% vaccination rate um, and the impact that this has on safety for all. So thank you, Tracy, and on to the last slide. And just briefly uh, to wrap up here, we do, you know, have some work to do. Oh, sorry, I thought there was one more. But uh, just, just to let folks know, we do have a little bit to do here too for the people who have not yet reported and for the people who have completed that education module. We, we are connecting and working with those individuals to help move them towards mandatory vaccination to make sure that we retain everybody as much as possible as we move through these phases, again, with the ultimate goal of having a fully vaccinated workforce um, in phase two. Uh, later, later this year. So thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy, for that uh, very helpful update. Uh, and now we are going to move into the questions that were pre-submitted before the call. And Catherine, I'm going to direct the first question to you. 
The question is, why do you believe it is a good idea to make COVID vaccination mandatory for your staff? Yes, well, certainly there are a number of reasons um, why this is a good move. First and foremost, and of relevance obviously to this group, is it's for our clients and families. As we know, it will further reduce the chance of transmission of infection, particularly for those who are most vulnerable. For our staff, service providers, students and volunteers, there's strong research that shows that vaccines are a very important strategy as they're effective in preventing serious illness and hospitalization. And we certainly want that uh, for our team. Also, VHA moved to a mandatory vaccination position um, as part of a collective move on behalf of 23 home care organizations in the province. So really for the health sector, this is a very powerful message that we're united uh, in the desire to provide high quality and safe care. And due to the fragile state of our depleted healthcare workforce, you know, really the only way to do this and ensure we can continue pro to provide safe and reliable home care is to do it together as a sector. Um, you know, working together as a collective minimizes our risk of losing people between organizations and hopefully minimizes the risk of losing people from the health sector completely. And, you know, as I mentioned, uh, we really can't afford to lose a single uh, health worker from our team. And finally, for health consumers and the public, you know, taking a consistent approach, not just across the home care sector, but aligned with uh, other uh, health organizations, it builds public confidence in our system and emphasizes more than ever you know, that home really is the safest place to receive care right now. So there's a lot of reasons for why it is the right thing right now. And I'm very proud to say that, uh, you know, our organization is, is taking that move along with so many of, uh, of our partner health organizations. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, and David, I'm going to direct the next uh, question to you. Uh, we have heard there is a shortage of home care workers as Catherine has been just speaking about. Can you speak to David, what are we doing to make sure clients receive the care they need? Sure, um, thanks very much, Tracy, and, and thank you for the question. And, and as Catherine mentioned, uh, certainly like no other time in the home and community care sector, we're experiencing a shortage of, of home care workers, whether it's personal support workers, uh, nurses who deliver shift care, and even uh, most recently in the last six months or so, we're experiencing pressures around our therapy services. So it really is unprecedented times in terms of the shortage of home care workers. I think first and foremost, what are we doing uh, in terms of making sure that our clients receive the care that they, they need? We're prioritizing every effort to minimize any disruptions in existing relationships with clients and families with a focus on what is the priority uh, or essential care. And so daily, our teams, whether it's the frontline teams who are out in the field supporting our teams, uh, work to prioritize where we may be experiencing some unexpected gaps or pressures, and they're triaging uh, and making uh, some changes in schedules based upon clients and caregiver needs. So we certainly uh, take the relationship and the needs of our clients very seriously. And we make those uh, changes uh, in a thoughtful way with lots of communication and preparation to clients and families, ultimately to try to be making sure that for the finite resources we do have, that we're meeting those essential care needs. Over the last year, uh, BHA has been trialing a variety of improvement ideas. So for example, on weekends, uh, we've been focusing in the Toronto area on trying to uh, tighten our geography area for our PSWs, our personal support workers, so they don't have to travel as much, so that we're able to maximize their time as much as possible, and look to our clients and families to help us in defining what is it that's essential. So what's the, the support that we can be providing on the weekend? And overall, that's helping us to minimize uh, last minute changes, it's helping to minimize cancellations, so it's things like that that we're exploring uh, as an organization to help address the truly uh, provincial crisis in terms of, of health care uh, and home and community care shortages. Thank you very much, David. And Kathy, I'm going to direct this next question your way. 
Uh, I understand the directive from the ministry uh, requires that any staff who are not fully vaccinated undergo testing every week. And you were speaking to this earlier. Uh, can you speak to what's happening around this at VHA? Yes, great, thanks, Stacey. So yes, as mentioned earlier, uh, Directive 6 does mandate that any uh, VHA worker or staff or service provider, student or volunteer, someone who's not fully vaccinated, meaning that they've had full two doses of vaccine, need to complete rapid antigen testing. So this is happening at VHA, and we've developed a rapid antigen testing program um, with an at-home testing approach. So people are going to be doing this, this testing at their home. And it is um, it does involve three main components. So there's a training component so that all of the people involved in rapid antigen testing know how to do the test. They know how to do the swabbing and how to get the test result. And then they know how to report their test results into our system so that we can monitor test results and, and see how that's going. Another component is that we have made sure that we have secured rapid antigen test kits to get out to those individuals and we'll be able to mail those out for the at-home testing on a regular basis. And then last, we've developed a reporting application, so sort of a reporting system where our team members will be putting their test results into that system and they'll be doing that two times per week um, they also will have some reminders that will help them make sure that they do their testing. And we have kind of fail safe alerts and notifications that if someone fails to do a test or that they have a failed test result, um, that the organization is alerted, the supervisors alerted, and there are instructions about um, uh, not proceeding to work at that time. So we have all of these safeguards that are built in around our rapid antigen testing program we're able to monitor those results. And we're also doing quality checks on the, the test results themselves to see what's coming in, um, making sure that they match up and um, that they're completed as they're supposed to. So we have that whole program um, packaged as per the required the, the requirement in Directive 6, and we're actively launching that this week. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And Kelly, I, I'm going to ask if you could answer this next question. There have been there's been a lot of coverage in the media about the challenges for nurses and other healthcare workers. How is VHA supporting our team members? Um, as we're in the fourth wave uh, of the pandemic, it is very true uh, that many healthcare workers um, are exhausted um, at VHA throughout the pandemic. Um, we've tried to balance uh, the need for time off um, for our workforce while still meeting the needs of our clients. We've encouraged staff to take time as needed, whether that's in the form of vacation time, personal days, or sick leave when that's appropriate. Our supervisors have worked with our teams to provide time off where possible so that staff can rest and recharge. And our teams have really pulled together to provide coverage for one another throughout the pandemic. We've also offered a range of supports to encourage all aspects of well being with a focus on mental health, physical health sleep, nutrition, exercise, financial well-being, and social connection, and of course, as Kathy has really talked about, workplace health and safety. We've built an extensive library of resources for our teams, and they can access these any time of the day or night, in addition to our employee assistance services, which are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, and lastly, we've also surveyed our teams to gain insight on the issues that matter most to them. And our leaders are focused on bringing about improvements based on this feedback. Thanks, Tracy. Thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, Catherine, I'm going to ask if you can speak to this next question. Why are you requiring staff to get vaccinated if they are already wearing full PPE? Yeah, thanks, Tracy. That's a great question uh, because certainly PPE, when it's used uh, properly, is very effective. It's in a very uh, effective strategy. 
Um, but the answer to this question is, I'm going to steal from some of my infection prevention and control colleagues. Uh, they call it the Swiss cheese model. <laughs> so if I might just explain where they're coming from. So vaccination is uh, yet another layer of defense for us and for uh, the clients and families that we serve. And the Swiss cheese strategy is a strategy that's uh, talked about um, regarding protection from an infectious respiratory disease like COVID. So if you picture a block of Swiss cheese sliced up, the holes in the slices don't line up. If you think about each slice as a defense strategy, so one could be screening, one could be hand hygiene, one could be distancing, one is masking or PPE, and one is vaccination. Each strategy or slice has holes that the virus can get through, but when you put them all together, the block is solid and it blocks transmission of the virus and transmission of the infection. So, so the Swiss cheese model is a good model, I think, to describe why just one strategy is never enough against um, an infectious respiratory illness. Um, and also, it's really important to say that vaccination is one of those strategies that's particularly effective. Um, it's got great evidence to show that it prevents serious illness and hospitalization. And in particular, uh, right now, as we're in a, a bit of a critical state with the pandemic, it is an even more important uh, defense strategy to make sure that we use because it's really, really important that we do everything we can to keep our schools, our businesses, and our communities open and keep our health system functioning properly. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. Um, I, I always find the Swiss cheese model a, a great way to, uh, to describe how this uh, makes it a, a great um, strategy of defense. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, absolutely. I can picture the Swiss cheese. That's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, David, I'm going to ask if you can speak to this next question. I am a new client to VHA who needs PSW assistance. There have already been instances when VHA wasn't able to send a worker or when we were told someone was coming and then they didn't show up. What are we supposed to do when this happens and how are you working to fix these issues? Uh, thank, thanks, Tracy, for the question. And, and the Swiss cheese is making me hungry as we approach the lunch hour. Um, I just would comment, I'm gonna start with the end. What, what are we doing to, to work on fixing these issues? So uh, we've set off an important uh, initiative internally that's working with clients, families, our team members to look at how do we improve our functions? How do we support our coordination teams in the important conversations that they have with clients and families in terms of their schedule? How do we make that work better? How can we deliver upon commitments of service when it comes to if we have to make changes in your care plan, which inevitably will have to happen because of how uh, you know, we're dealing with human beings and people have unexpected changes in their day. So I just would say first and foremost, we are doing some important work internally. This work is, is uh, refreshed in the last fall or this fall rather, and it's really anchored in trying to make things more um, client-centered, focused around uh, living into the commitments that we wanna make around improving communication. If unfortunately though, just backing up in terms of a, a PSW not arriving today, so if you did have an instance today where a worker doesn't show up, um, of course, first off, it, uh, our apologies uh, for that inconvenience because we can appreciate that our PSWs in particular are often a lifeline to, to our clients and families, uh, and that inconvenience can really be very disruptive. So, so apologies for that experience. The, the main suggestion would be for a client and family member to call our office at our main number, uh, let our team member know um, what, what's taken place, that someone hasn't arrived, and internally, what we will do is follow up with our PSW to make sure they're safe, check in on their whereabouts, and then connect back with our client and family member around how could we uh, look to reschedule their care. Um, but as I said, looking at ways that we can make these, uh, make our communication, make our connection uh, with clients and families around important schedules, that, that is an area that we appreciate. There's lots of improvement work for us to be making. 
Thanks very much, David. Uh, Kathy, I'm gonna ask if you could speak to this next question. What protective equipment are staff expected to wear when they are in my home? Great, thanks, Tracy. Um, so home care workers can be expected to be wearing their universal surgical mask and universal um, eye protection. So whether that's a face shield or goggles for all visits. So you'll expect to see all your home care workers having those two things for all visits. Um, now, if the client passes that COVID-19 um, respiratory screener that I mentioned a bit earlier, um, staff will continue to follow routine IPAC practices and they would have the option of wearing a glove and gown just as they would in a normal circumstances where if they feel they're gonna be exposed to bodily fluids or fluids of some sort, they would put on their glove and their gown. Um, if they're not gonna be exposed to that, you may not see your worker wearing gloves, um, but do know that those individuals are performing rigorous hand hygiene. You'll see them using their alcohol-based hand soap uh, or hand rub for hand hygiene, or, or they'll be washing their hands in soapy water at, at the sink. So now in situations, I'm gonna get into a little bit more nitty gritty detail here, but if in a situation, a, a client or if you're an individual um, that doesn't pass the COVID-19 respiratory screener that I mentioned, um, or if you are symptomatic, or if there's an infectious disease that's indicated um, for the individual, our home care workers will be then in that instance wearing, you'll see them with gloves and gowns in addition to the mask and the face shield at, at that point. Um, so those are situations where you would see them with all four of those items on. And I'm gonna speak a little bit more detail to one other situation that if um, it is that a client has our, um, an, an airborne disease, so where there's um, aerosolized particles or an airborne based condition, or if our worker is performing what is called an aerosol generating medical procedure, so we call them AGMPs, um, where there's a risk of aerosolized uh, particles to be in the environment. At that point, um, or at this point, actually, the evidence suggests that our worker be wearing an N95 mask. So that's the only indication for when you'll see a worker wearing that N95 or N95 mask. Um, and that is actually to help keep the home care worker safe from the particles that are in um, aerosolized in the air. Um, so that is a situation where you'll see that mask specifically being worn. I will speak just briefly about booties as well, because sometimes people ask about the footwear. Um, so booties themselves, those things that cover people's feet are not a part of formal PPE. Um, staff, again, are not to wear their outdoor shoes in, into clients' home. It's VHA policy that individuals have like a, a dedicated indoor shoe um, or a shoe cover of some sort, but just booties themselves are not part of um, a, a personal protective uh, equipment or part of that package. So hope that helps. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Kathy. Kelly, I'm hoping you could speak to this next question. My PSW left the workforce earlier in the pandemic because she had to stay home with her children when they were doing school online from home. Have most workers in this situation come back? And how are you managing this? Thanks, Tracy. So at, at VHA, we have had over 1,000 unique um, leaves of absence throughout the pandemic. As staff have needed time off for personal reasons uh, or to support their families. Despite this, um, we've continued uh, to manage to provide services uh, that are needed to clients and their families. The shift to virtual care in both our rehab and nursing services has helped to increase our capacity to deliver care. Um, we've also worked hard to continue to recruit workers and as um, Catherine mentioned, retain the talent that we have. While most of our workers have returned, we still have numerous staff who are out on leave. Our supervisors are in regular contact with them and have created return to work plans on a case-by-case -case basis to meet the unique needs of each staff member. Um, we've seen an encouraging positive trend over the past few weeks as the COVID numbers have leveled off and children have returned to school. Thanks very much, Kelly. 
Uh, David, I'm hoping you can speak to this next question. I am a mother of a child with complex medical needs who can't go to school without a nurse. What are you doing to support our family? Uh, I think, thank you, Tracy, for the question. And, and unfortunately, uh, similar to many of the other services and disciplines that, that I spoke about earlier, child and family nursing service, this, this September has been uh, significantly impacted by uh, challenges with either nurses uh, leaving our sector or, or changes in terms of their availability. And, and for each child, especially uh, medically complex children and families, we work very hard to prioritize their needs and, and ensure as, as much as possible we're meeting their needs. That has not been the case this September in all cases. Uh, so we actively are continuing our, as Kelly mentioned, to improve our, our recruitment efforts, work with other service provider partners and other agencies to identify some sustainable solutions. So for example, this fall, uh, we've entered into a partnership with an organization that will help us in being able to, to deliver nursing care for child and families, and in particular, child uh, children who, who need shift type of support, so more continuous care while they're at school. And so we think that partnership will help us in alleviating some of the pressures and the difficulties that families are experiencing. Um, and, and we look for other solutions with our other partners. Thank you, David. Uh, Kelly, I'm, I'm gonna uh, direct this question your way. Can I request only fully vaccinated staff? If not, can you explain why not? And why can't I ask my worker if they're vaccinated? Okay, so as Kathy described, um, VHA is moving toward a fully vaccinated workforce, um, and we're really pleased to report um, that our reporting rates um, are currently very high. Again, as Kathy mentioned, with 92% um, with two doses, another 5% with a second dose um, pending, bringing us up to 97%. Um, with respect uh, to requesting fully vaccinated staff, we are obligated to follow the guidelines provided by Home and Community Care Support Services, and they have mandated that visits are not to be scheduled on the basis of vaccination status. Um, you can ask your healthcare workers if they are vaccinated. However, it is up to each individual staff member to determine um, whether they're comfortable disclosing their personal health information, um, which is protected by law. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Kathy, I am hoping you could speak to this next question. Are you keeping track of which clients are vaccinated? And are you expecting clients to get vaccinated? Great, thank you, Tracy. So to answer the first question, no, we are not keeping track of which clients are vaccinated. We're not tracking that or recording that in any way. And the reason is, you know, knowing someone's vaccination status does not um, factor in or impact the care that we provide. So it's 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 not a piece of information that would impact any of our, our practices or the way that we would deliver care. So we are not tracking that. Um, to answer the second question, are we expecting clients to get vaccinated? Um, I would say that we are certainly expecting or suspecting that our client and family vaccination rates mirror that of the Ontario's provincial vaccination rate. So I believe we're at about 72% now of fully, fully two-dose vaccinated Ontarians in the province. So I would suspect um, that our client and family would mirror that percentage, although we do suspect that probably even a larger number of our clients and families are fully vaccinated. Um, since the introduction of vaccinations last year and with our position statement, um, we certainly have taken the stance of also encouraging and strongly encouraging not only our home care workers, but also our clients and families to get vaccinated um, as that additional safety measure that Catherine so nicely described in terms of it being an extra layer of protection um, to reduce the spread of COVID-19, to reduce serious illness and hospitalization for our clients and families as well. So um, thank you, Tracy. Thank you very much, Kathy. 
Uh, David, I'm going to pose this next question to you. How are you making sure your staff are following all the necessary protocols to keep everyone safe? Uh, thanks, thanks, Tracy. I think what I would just comment on, uh, Kathy talked earlier about a number of different ways um, that our infection control team work closely uh, with our client services supervisors, our frontline team members in the field. So we have a number of different ways, whether it's training, specific uh, self-assessment self protocols uh, that our team work uh, very closely with our infection control colleagues to help make sure that we are following all the necessary protocols. Thanks very much, David. Uh, and Kathy, I'm going to come back to you for this one. I am homebound and haven't received a COVID vaccination yet. Could you help me get vaccinated? Thank you, Tracy, and thank you for this question. I'm so glad it's here um, because it's so important to remember that there are still so many individuals that are looking to be vaccinated, and we need to ensure that everyone has access to vaccines. Um, so in general, just to start to help, um, we have posted information for clients and families on our website, www.vha.ca. And you'll see on the website, we have a tile that's called COVID-19 information for clients and families. And when you click on that and scroll down, we have a whole section about where to go for vaccination information. And in there, there are at least six or seven tips and options about um, places you could go, air, um, individuals that you can contact to help book vaccination appointments. So it includes things like the link to the provincial booking system, the online link and the phone number. There's actually information for those in the, in the city of Toronto around a transportation plan from the city that will help vulnerable residents actually get transportation to a clinic. We also have information now about third dose vaccinations that are now available to eligible um, special populations. And for specifically for homebound clients, uh, the option here would always be to contact your home and community care support services, uh, regional contact. So whether you have a coordinator uh, to be able to contact your HCCSS coordinator and ask them um, to help you navigate getting a vaccination appointment, that individual will help you, um, help you navigate that and coordinate that and get that booked. As well, there's always additional options to contact your local pharmacy or your family physician to help with further options uh, to get vaccinated. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you very much, Kathy. Uh, and this is going to be our last question for the town hall, and I'm going to direct this to you, Catherine. I feel like I'm worrying all the time. I worry about the wonderful PSWs who come to my home, and I hope they'll be okay. And I also worry that my husband and I won't get the care we need if our PSWs don't show up because there aren't enough workers. With the fourth wave continuing and such an extreme shortage of staff, is there anything you can tell me to reassure me? Thanks, Tracy. And uh, I understand the worry. I worry too for different reasons. Um, but it is distressing to hear that uh, there's so much anxiety with clients and families worrying about PSWs and, uh, and whether they're going to receive the home support they need. So we've talked a lot this morning about the health human resources uh, crisis that we're in um, as a health sector and obviously relevant to us is the home sector, home health care sector. And we've certainly struggled with a lack of PSWs or not enough PSWs for about four years. And as we've spoken about, this is spread now uh, during the pandemic to nursing and to uh, therapy as well. And we know it's across many sectors, sadly. It's across the whole health sector and we're seeing it as well in food, retail, tourism and others. Um, and so while it is certainly concerning if, if we are to think about what is reassuring, um, what I think is reassuring is that it came out very clear uh, that um, the safest way to receive care is in the home during a pandemic, and that has not ever been as widely recognized as it, as it is now. Um, and there is a real increased awareness among health leaders 
of that fact, and also that a healthy home sector, healthy home care sector, is critical to ensuring hospitals are able to discharge patients, avoid hallway medicine, and avoid crowding of their emergency departments. They cannot do this alone, and I think that there has been uh, widespread uh, new levels of understanding um, in this regard. And we actually have many, many health sector leaders, even beyond home care, advocating loudly for investments in home care. So that is reassuring to me as a, as a home care leader. And certainly while this team here, the team at BHA and, and certainly myself, we're very committed to ongoing positive collective advocacy for a healthy and stable home care system for Ontarians, it will, we will only be um, successful if we have uh, the whole sector behind us. And so I believe we're certainly going in that direction. So I personally find that reassuring and I, I, I hope that you find that uh, reassuring too. I think the other hope is that, you know, as we move from a pandemic state to a state where we're more in recovery, uh, that our HHR uh, situation will improve. Um, and I, 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 have, I know I have colleagues who, who certainly feel that we're in a, in a very acute stage at the moment, but that there is hope at the end of the tunnel. So I'm, I'm, I'm holding that as also being uh, reassuring. And, and, and again, I hope that that, uh, that helps with the worry and the distress that many of our clients and families have. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, and on that hopeful note, uh, we will conclude our, our town hall there. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, and thanks very much to Catherine and Kathy and Kelly and David uh, for sharing all of that information. We hope everyone found it helpful. We will be posting a recording uh, of this town hall on our website uh, that will be up uh, later this week. And we will be including it in the next issue of our voice newsletter for clients and families. So if by chance you are not already receiving our voice newsletter and would like to do so, uh, or if you have any additional questions that we weren't able to answer today during the call, please send an email to communications at vha.ca, or you can call 416-280-8426, and we'll do our best uh, to answer your questions and, and get you that voice newsletter if you'd like to receive it regularly. Uh, so thanks again, uh, everyone, for joining us, uh, and uh, we hope you will all take good care uh, and have a good day.